sclerosis. Thank you, Raquel. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pilar Munoz Calera, for inviting me. It's always a pleasure. And uh, I also want to th thank, thank both her and uh, Dr. Ansorg for doing some of my work for me, which <laughs> I dearly needed. Um, let me just say I'm going to dedicate my talk today to Judith Lansfield, who's been my partner of 24 years, who was ill and cannot be with us. Um, she's been as much of a as much dedicated to my work over the last 13 years as I have, and I think that uh, I very much appreciate that. So I'm going to be talking about these three diseases uh, mainly, but uh, um, some of this uh, I, I'm going to deal with them first by dealing with some rather broad topics, and I think you'll see how they relate uh, to these. But some of the information that I'm going to talk about comes from my book, some from a variety of papers that I've written, and some from other, other aspects of the, uh, of the literature. Uh, there are three main uh, issues that I'm going to deal with today. Uh, one is that there are a very large number of toxicants that appear to act as toxicants in the body, uh, largely by producing excessive activity of what are called the NMDA receptors in the body. So the NMDA receptors are responsible for excitotoxicity. Uh, they occur in many parts of the body. And uh, as you're going to see, uh, they, uh, they have a, a key role in producing uh, toxic responses to many, many chemicals. So that's the first thing, and I think that's a very important concept uh, that's relatively novel. Uh, the second is that the various diseases that are initiated uh, by such toxicants uh, acting again uh, via excessive NMDA activity um, are, are associated with themselves excessive NMDA activity. So it's very plausible to argue that this activity is the key issue in terms of initiating uh, these, uh, these diseases uh, in response to these various toxicants. Okay? The third is uh, something that you've heard about, fortunately, uh, already today. And that is that a number of these diseases uh, can be argued to be noonocycle diseases. And I'm going to talk in detail, or at least in some detail, about three of them, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and multiple sclerosis. But there are a whole series of others uh, that also can be argued to be noonocycle diseases. And, uh, and uh, let me just say that some of the things that I'll talk about with regard to these three diseases can be generalized to a number of other noonocycle diseases as well. Um, so the NMDA receptors are a class of receptors for glutamate, and uh, they're widely distributed in both the central and peripheral nervous system. And uh, while they've been most studied in the brain and to a lesser extent in the spinal cord, uh, they have central roles in, uh, in, uh, in other, other tissues. And uh, among the non-neuronal cells and tissues that contain NMDA receptors, are thymocytes, stomach, bone, including osteoclasts and osteoblasts, cartilage, including chondrocytes, skin, including keratinocytes, regions of the vascular endothelium, kidney, lung, lymphocytes, beta cells of the pancreas, uh, adrenal gland, heart, thyroid, astrocytes, testis, and synoviocytes. And I think what's true is that we're continually learning about new sites in which the NMDA receptors are occurring. So this, is, uh, this may well be a partial list at this point. And, uh, and, uh, and, and so the, the possibilities of the NMDA receptors being involved in a large variety of tissues is certainly one that, uh, that one needs to consider here. Uh, nevertheless, most of the toxicity uh, 
that's been shown to be mediated through those receptors occurs in the brains. And that's been the main focus of study to date. Uh, in multiple chemical sensitivity, there are seven classes of chemicals that have been implicated in initiating cases uh, and also in triggering sensitivity symptoms in those who are already sensitive. And uh, I've got six of those listed in this figure. And what you can see is that each of them acts along a particular pathway to produce excessive activity of the NMDA receptors. And, uh, and so one has the organic solvents, which are thought to act via some of the TRP group of receptors, particularly TRPA1, um, to produce excessive uh, NMDA activity. We've got three classes of pesticides the organophosphorus and carbamate pesticides that act biochemically along this pathway, the organochlorine pesticides that act biochemically along this pathway, the pyrethroids that act biochemically along this pathway, and then we've got a few specific things, hydrogen sulfide that uh, happens to act on the same receptors that we think the organic solvents uh, uh, trigger, and uh, mercury which acts uh, to inhibit glutamate transport. And uh, um, glutamate, as I said before, is the main physiological agonist of the NMDA receptors. And consequently, if you inhibit glutamate transport, you accumulate more glutamate in the extracellular fluid, and therefore you stimulate the receptors, okay? So each of these has a known pathway, and each of these appears to uh, produce toxic effects via excessive NMDA activity. Now, so you can see already a vast array of chemicals here that are implicated uh, specifically in MCS, but it turns out there are many, many more chemicals that also act via excessive NMDA activity. And so what I'm going to do is to go through uh, uh, a whole bunch of those rather briefly and will give you some idea of the breadth of action of chemicals that uh, produce this uh, common response. Now let me just point out one thing before I go any further, however. These chemicals do not all produce the same pathophysiological response in the body. Why? Well, simply because uh, the, the, the uh, tissues in which they're active in producing this response uh, can vary depending on what chemicals are involved and what pathways they act along, okay? so. One can have, uh, uh, you know, certain tissues uh, in response to one uh, set of chemicals and perhaps somewhat different tissue distribution in response to others, okay? So they're not all the same in terms of their physiological response, but they are all the same in terms of their um, uh, sort of common endpoint of action, okay? Okay, uh, oh, I, and let me just say the, the, the issue with organic solvents is at least somewhat um, unclear because most of them have never been tested uh, to determine whether they have, um, uh, whether they produce responses via uh, excessive NMDA activity. However, there are a whole series of compounds that are known as sensory irritants, which include all of these groups of chemicals. Um, and, uh, you know, and these are all, of course, organic compounds, but even chlorine can act as a sensory irritant. Um, these these uh, really extraordinarily diverse group of chemicals have uh, been shown to be, their action has been shown to be mediated through this TRP, TRPA1 receptor, which, um, as I indicated before, in this, uh, in this uh, diagram acts, uh, to then stimulate the NMDA receptors, okay? All right. um, now, one of the things about the NMDA receptors which is important is that uh, it's known that when you have a deficiency in, the, in mitochondrial activity, and the mitochondria, of course, are, are key uh, organelles in terms of uh, producing energy in the cell and producing ATP. Um, when you have a deficiency then in ATP, there are two known mechanisms that lead to excessive NMDA activity. And these are, are, are well documented and I'm not going to 
talk about them, but one of them has to do with the transport of glutamate, uh, and the other one has to do with the actual properties of the receptors, okay? So, uh, uh, so uh, because of that, uh, agents that lead to lowered energy metabolism via mitochondrial dysfunction are at least potential agents to produce excessive NMDA activity. Um, now, some of those have been studied and shown to produce excessive NMDA activity. They include MPTP and rotenone, which are classic initiators of uh, Parkinson's disease, and uh, they include cyanide, um, and uh, they include carbon monoxide and hypoxia. Okay, so all of these have been shown to produce uh, toxic effects in the body that are at least in part uh, mediated through the action of the NMDA receptors. Um, and as I'll show you later, there are other compounds that, that, that are also known to be um, to, to uh, lower mitochondrial function that may act this way, but we really don't know yet for sure whether they do because as far as I can figure out, nobody's ever looked at them. Uh, so, um, now I talked about before about, uh, about, about insecticides that act uh, via excessive NMDA activities. There are also herbicides that do it. Uh, one of them is a herbicide called glufosinase, which is also known as Basta or Phosphonothricin, and Paraquat, another fairly commonly used pesticide. Uh, and those have both have been shown in the literature to act at least in part via excessive NMDA activity. Again, the, the evidence here is that you can lower their toxicity by using an NMDA antagonist, by using a drug that lowers this response, okay? Now, two very commonly used herbicides, uh, Roundup and 2,4-D, 2,4-dichlorophenoxyacetic acid, um, have both been shown to produce mitochondrial energy metabolism dysfunction. Uh, so one, one might expect that they would produce excessive NMDA activity, but to my knowledge, no one's ever looked at them for that. Okay, so we don't know whether that's true or not, but based on their, uh, on their toxic responses in the body, uh, you would predict that they would act this way, okay? Um, there are a series of fungicides that have been shown to act uh, via excessive NMDA activity, including uh, these uh, Manab, Man Mancozeb, uh, whatever, however that's pronounced, and, the, and the, the dithiocarbamate group of fungicides in general. Uh, these all act by excessive NMDA activity, and as you'll see, uh, for instance, MADA uh, has a role in initiating cases of Parkinson's disease, okay? So uh, I'm going to relate this now to, uh, as we go along, a little bit to some of the things that you're going to see later. Okay, uh, there are four classes of antibiotics that produce toxic responses in the body, again, via excessive N N NMDA activity, and these include the quinolone antibiotics, the immunoglycoside antibiotics, beta-lactam antibiotics, so this is this, you know, big group that includes, uh, of course, penicillin, and isoniazid, which, of course, is used to treat uh, tuberculosis, among other things. Um, so here we have still other chemicals that act by excessive NMDA activity. Salicylates, um, been shown to have toxicity in the inner ear uh, that is mediated by excessive NMDA activity. And let me just say, uh, salicylates have roles in initiating cases of tinnitus, another nonocycle disease, or at least apparent nonocycle disease. And, uh, and so uh, uh, that apparently acts, again, by excessive NMDA activity, uh, specifically in the inner ear, okay? Now, uh, there are a number of uh, tropical uh, toxins that are picked up by shellfish and by other uh, uh, tropical organisms um, that produce at least part of their toxic effects. Um, and this, of course, is uh, exclusive of allergic reactions via excessive NMDA activity, and these include the moic acid, the brevitoxin, ciguatoxin. So ciguatoxin is a toxin that's uh, at least occasionally involved in initiating cases of chronic fatigue syndrome. So this is another, um, um, you know, thing that works via excessive NMDA activity that has a role in initiating uh, presumed nonocycle disease, okay? And uh, so you see these over and over again, and I think, uh, 
Um, now, uh, and, and there are a number of compounds that are produced in the human body which stimulate the NMDA receptors. Uh, quinolinic acid, homocysteine, ammonia, and bilirubin. And I'm just going to talk about these last two. Uh, why? Uh, well, basically both of these uh, accumulate at quite high levels whenever you have uh, hepatic dysfunction, okay? And, uh, and so whenever you have a uh, hepatotoxin or a, or a hepatotoxicant, so when you have a toxic compound that impacts the liver, uh, you can get, if you have enough of it, hepatic encephalopathy, okay? So what does this mean? This means that you start out with liver dysfunction, but you end up with brain dysfunction, okay? How does that work? Uh, well, a lot of it works via ammonia. Uh, when you accumulate high levels of ammonia, what does that do? It goes up to the brain and it increases glutamate levels and it increases NMDA activity, okay? So a lot of the hepatic encephalopathy is mediated through the NMDA receptors. Bilirubin also stimulates the NMDA receptors as well, although it's probably ammonia is the primary mechanism here and bilirubin is secondary, okay? So this is an interesting situation where uh, toxicants that act on the liver, and as far as we can tell, the liver has no NMDA receptors whatsoever. Nevertheless, the toxic effects in the body are mediated to a substantial extent through the NMDA receptors in the brain. And in fact, you can, uh, you can prolong the life of, uh, of, of animals and people uh, who have, you know, have been impacted by uh, hepatotoxicants by using an NMDA antagonist, okay? And so that's something that, uh, you know, that uh, I, I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, observation. Now the, the point, of course, the important point here is that here we have another class, a very large class of toxicants, namely toxicants that act primarily on the liver, that act at least in part via excessive NMDA activity, in this case in the brain. Okay, okay so we have uh, uh, a, really a vast array of compounds that, in summary, that, uh, that appear to act by excessive NMDA activity, including this already vast array of organic solvents and related compounds. Three major classes of pesticides, several herbicides, several fungicides. Toxic metals, actually, I had intended to talk about, but uh, we talked about mercury, uh, but it turns out that uh, lead and, uh, and uh, uranium uh, also appear to act by excessive NMDA activity. Uh, the four classes of antibiotics, a uh, large array of liver toxicants, uh, various mitochondrial toxicants, selfish toxins, and a number of others. Okay, so you see this really stunning array of compounds where you have a common response. Okay, now, so, um, you know, what I'm going to tell you is that these stunning array of compounds act as initiators for a variety of different diseases, um, and those are all diseases where you already have evidence for excessive NMDA activity, and they're also all diseases where uh, I've made a case that they are probable nonocycle diseases. And the three we're going to concentrate on are Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and multiple sclerosis, and that's been uh, that was what I was asked to talk about, and that's going to be the focus now of the rest of my talk, okay? And so uh, uh, we're going to talk about those. But before talking about them, I want to say a little bit about the no-no cycle, okay? And, uh, and so you've already heard about it, and uh, basically uh, uh, what I'm going to do is go through this uh, a little bit quick and dirty because we really don't have time to do anything else. Um, this is the current version of the no no cycle. It keeps changing a little bit uh, over time. And, uh, and, and you, you've already heard about a lot of these things, uh, the NMDA receptors, uh, intracellular calcium, the uh, inflammatory cytokines, the inducible nitric oxide synthase, NF-kappa-B, uh, 
oxidative stress, which is sort of a, a, an imbalance between oxidants and antioxidants. Uh, ONO is peroxynitrite, um, which is a potent oxidant and which is why it produces oxidative stress. Nitric oxide, superoxide. Um, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, which leads to ATP depletion, um, BH4 depletion, tetrahydrobiopterin. Uh, why is it depleted? Well, because peroxynitrite oxidizes it. We know that. And, uh, and I've argued, and, and you've already heard Dr. Ansari talk about this, uh, that, uh, that, that this in turn can, can act back to produce more uh, peroxynitrite. Uh, we also have some of these trip receptors. I've talked about two of them already, TRPA1, TRPV1. Uh, there's another one, TRPM2. All three of those are stimulated by oxidants, so this guy goes up as well. Now, when you look at this thing, you say, oh, God, it's so complicated. How am I ever going to make sense out of that? Um, and, and so one thing I've done, and I have to say I, I apologize to those of you who heard me talk about this before, um, one thing I've done is kind of break this down into a little subgroup so you can make a little bit more sense out of it, okay? So my next slides are kind of breaking this thing down, okay? Um, and so basically what we're doing is, is uh, having colored uh, arrows which, um, which kind of emphasize certain parts of the overall no no cycle. And you see how they, how they kind of fit together in this way. Um, okay, so let me just say, uh, first of all, each of these arrows represents one or more mechanisms by which one thing stimulates another, okay? So, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and what you can see here, I think, is that, well, we've got things that kind of go around in circles, okay? So there's this one, and there's that one, and then there's this one. This is actually a double-headed arrow, and, 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 uh, and, and so things can go back and forth here, but they can also go this way. Uh, what are, you know, so, um, so you can kind of see how once this thing gets started, it would tend to, pr tend to propagate itself over time, okay? Now, um, uh, so one of the things that, uh, so what are these? Well, this is, this is basically inflammatory biochemistry, okay? This, this part of this cycle will generate inflammation and, uh, and essentially the whole inflammatory cascade will be generated from this. The inflammatory cytokines, INOS induction, NF-kappa B, all have a very important uh, uh, inflammatory roles. Uh, NF-kappa B is stimulated by oxidants, by peroxynitrite and also by other, other oxidants, okay? So that's what these two arrows are. Um, in turn, what does that do? Well, it induces INOS, the inducible nitric oxide synthase, which produces more nitric oxide, which reacts with superoxide to form more peroxynitrite. So you can kind of see, here's a cycle, right? Here's another cycle. The cytokines also have important roles here as well. And these five cytokines all are stimulated, uh, the genes are all stimulated by NF-kappa B, okay? Uh, some of them come back and stimulate NF-kappa B. Some of them can act directly on INOS. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, we, so we have those, okay? Um, so here are a bunch of cycles already. Once they get going, they're going to tend to propagate themselves on their own. Let me just, uh, there's one thing I haven't emphasized yet, and I want to do that before I go on, okay? And that is that these three compounds that are center, central to to the cycle, nitric oxide, superoxide, and peroxynitrite, have short half-lives in biological tissues. They don't go very far from where they're made to where they're destroyed. And all of these arrows, all of these mechanisms that I talk about, all these arrows that are part of the cycle act at the level of individual cells. Now because of that, because of those two facts, you predict that the cycle will be primarily local, okay? And consequently, you can turn the cycle on in one tissue, another tissue may be largely unimpacted by it. And, uh, and, and once it gets turned on in one tissue, it will tend to propagate itself in that tissue, okay? So, um, so because of that, cycle diseases could be very diverse depending on where the cycle is located in the body. And that's an absolutely key issue. The only way in which you can explain 
multiple diseases via a single cycle is, uh, is by having a different tissue impact and different diseases. And that's, uh, um, you know, that, that, so that's a, a really key issue. And I think you can see that many of the diseases, uh, you know, that, that we, that at least, you know, I mean, you talk about Parkinson's, you talk about Alzheimer's, you talk about uh, multiple sclerosis, you can talk about a, a whole bunch of others. Uh, they differ from each other in what tissues are involved. Okay, so let's go on. Here's another cycle that involves excessive NMDA activity, okay? And so here's um, ATP depletion, uh, and I said earlier that produces uh, increased NMDA activity. And then the NMDA receptors are activated, they uh, allow calcium to flow in the cell, that in turn activates these two enzymes, nitric oxide synthases, which are calcium dependent enzymes in turn produces nitric oxide, okay? Now, one thing about this, and this, this, whole, this whole part of the cycle is, uh, is basically a cascade of events, most of which occurs in the mitochondria. And there's a very complex cascade of events that occurs in the mitochondria in response to excessive nitric oxide, uh, which leads to increased superoxide production, increased peroxynitrite, uh, decreased ATP production. And, uh, and, and uh, so, uh, so that's basically a whole series of events, each of which are, are well described. And, uh, and they uh, then lead to uh, lowered ATP production, which in turn leads to increased NMDA activity. Um, so again, here's a whole complex cycle that is going to tend to go on of its own accord once it gets started. Um, here's the central couplet, which Dr. Unsorg kindly talked about before, which is the kind of smallest part of the cycle where proxynitrite oxidizes tetrahydrobiopterin. This in turn leads to a partial uncoupling of the nitric oxide synthases, which we predict is going to produce more proxynitrite. And so uh, um, this is another, another part of the cycle we think is important. And it's going to interact with all those other cycles we just talked about. Uh, here's still another one that involves the trip receptors. Those three trip receptors that I mentioned are activated by oxidants, and, uh, and so they can act in this way, okay? Um, and, uh, and then there's a fifth one that I put in here. Um, there's an enzyme, a calcium ATPase, which has a key role in keeping intracellular calcium levels low, okay? Um, and like all ATPases, it requires ATP. And if you have a deficiency in ATP, then you have a deficiency in the ATPase, and you get higher levels of intracellular calcium. Uh, and what does that do? Well, it triggers a lot of the cycle, okay? Now, um, one of the things, the other thing about the calcium ATPase is it's inactivated by oxidants, including proxynitrite and other oxidants. And so these things are going to go and lower the calcium ATPase, which will raise intracellular calcium. All right, so you got all of these things kind of going together. And let me just say you can actually draw out some other cycles. But you can kind of see how this, you know, all of these cycles kind of working on each other is going to produce a really robust mechanism. And the challenge in treating nonocycle diseases is to downregulate all of this stuff. And so we all have a great challenge in front of us, okay? And let me just say, I propose that, uh, that uh, 20 different diseases are caused by the no-no cycle, and none of them are cured by conventional allopathic medicine, not one. And most of them, you don't even have decent treatments for, decent treatments for them. Um, now, this stuff came originally, this whole concept came originally from these four diseases, chronic fatigue syndrome, multiple chemical sensitivity, fibromyalgia, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, each of those, according to the literature, has have various kinds of stressors, short-term stressors, that can initiate cases of those diseases, okay? And we've already talked about these uh, seven groups of chemicals. Um, but, you know, and, and a chronic fatigue syndrome, you know, most cases are caused by, are initiated by, by infections. But there are uh, at least three uh, types of chemicals that uh, can initiate um, 
which are organophosphorus pesticides, carbon monoxide, and cyclotoxin. And all of those, as you've already heard, uh, can act by excessive NMDA activity. Okay? So, you know, what you see here is that all stressors that um, are involved. Uh, you know, um, may not be uh, may not be chemicals. Uh, they may act in somewhat different ways. But you know, when you find chemicals involved, many of them at least uh, can act by excessive NMDA activity to initiate uh, the disease. And all of these can act that way. On the other hand, these others in fibromyalgia and post-traumatic stress disorder uh, are, are different kinds of stressors. Okay, and so. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, they, so uh, what I'm going to focus on in my talk are the chemical stressors. And, but you have to realize that there are other stressors that can often initiate these diseases, okay? Okay. Um, so let me say, you know, there are five principles that kind of underlie the no-no cycle. And, uh, and, and each of them act both as, as principles for understanding the mechanism, they also act as principles for deciding is a particular disease a good candidate to be a no cycle disease, okay? So basically you look at each disease and you ask, you know, how, got, how good is the fit to each of the five principles? And uh, so, and obviously we don't have time to talk about, you know, these for specific diseases. But, uh, you know, except maybe the first one we're going to talk about. So the first, the first principle is, you know, can cases be initiated by short-term stressors that increase cycle elements? And, uh, you know, as I, um, as I said, as I said earlier, uh, you know, a lot of these chemicals act by excessive NMDA activity, uh, but there, there, are other, there are other mechanisms as well. Um, you predict the chronic phase of illness, which is produced by the no-no cycle, that each of the elements of the cycle will be elevated in the chronic phase of illness. So the question is, you know, do we have evidence, have people looked at these, and if so, are they elevated? Uh, this, the third question is, uh, can the symptoms and signs of illness be generated by one or more elements of the cycle? Obviously, if the cycle is causal, this must be true, okay? And so that's testable. Um, Fourth mechanism is, uh, is uh, and, and this has to do with the local nature that I, I mentioned earlier, okay? Uh, is there evidence for a primarily local mechanism uh, for the disease? Uh, a mechanism uh, located in, uh, in one or more specific tissues, okay? Um, and uh, let me just say that uh, uh, I'm not saying here that there are never systemic changes in response to these diseases. There are systemic changes. Uh, you know, you get, you get systemic depletion of antioxidants. You get, to some extent, systemic uh, rises in, uh, in, the, in the inflammatory cytokines. Uh, there are a number of things that are systemic. You actually can get uh, uh, at least somewhat systemic depletion of VH4, okay? Uh, so there are a number of things that are systemic, but the primary mechanism is local, and that's, that's the key issue here. Uh, the fifth um, principle is that these diseases should be treated by downregulating the non cycle biochemistry rather than by symptomatic relief, okay? Don't treat the symptoms, treat the cause. And so in terms of uh, specific diseases, the question that you raise is, are there agents that are predicted to downregulate different aspects of the cycle that are useful in therapy? And that's the specific question you ask about specific diseases when you ask, could that disease be known or cycle disease? Um, there are 34 distinct mechanisms that currently make up the no-no cycle uh, model that are all well-accepted, uh, well-documented biochemistry and physiology. Uh, 31 of these have been clearly reported to have substantial pathophysiological roles in human disease, or, or at least in animal models of human disease. And, uh, uh, and so basically, uh, you know, one argues from this, there's really nothing novel about the cycle except when you put it together, you obviously see very novel things. And that's what I've been trying to emphasize. Um, now, we don't have time to talk about these 34, uh, 
But what I've got here is the list of them, and you can look at them in your notes, I guess, right? You have copies of these, is that right? We have copies? Yeah. Has everybody got copies? Huh? Oh, you haven't made them. Oh, okay. Well, ask for them. There you go. Um, so here are the 34, and uh, hopefully you can look at them in your, at your leisure, because we don't have time to talk about them now. Um, here are the 20, the 20 uh, diseases that I've argued are probable known on cycle diseases. And, uh, and so, uh, uh, and most of these differ from each other in their localization, are that, although not all. You have things like autism that are different in terms of when they start and therefore perhaps how they play out. Um, but you can uh, you basically make an argument for, all t for each of these 20 that, that it's a known cycle disease. And again, we don't have time to talk about those. The three that we're going to talk about, at least in terms of initiation, are multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, and Alzheimer's disease. And those are the three that I was asked to talk about. So, um, okay. So how do various toxicants act? to initiate cases of these diseases. And let me just say, for Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, there's typically a fairly long latency between exposure to chemical and the occurrence of symptoms. So these are generally considered to be risk factors um, uh, because you can't, you know, because of this long time delay. I'm going to talk about them as initiators. I guess you can argue with that terminology if you wish. Um, but so what, what are these according to the literature for Parkinson's disease? And I've listed a whole series of these. And each of these has been reported in the literature to uh, have roles in initiating cases of Parkinson's disease. And a number of these are, are uh, agents which, uh, which uh, act uh, um, in animal models of Parkinson's disease. So you can show that they have causal roles in animal models, okay? Uh, this manganese, by the way, we're talking about quite high, high concentrations of manganese, okay? And I want to make that very clear. Uh, but uh, so each of these, every single one of them, here we've got Manab, uh, a, a fungicide, paraguat, herbicide, uh, organic solvents, uh, organophosphorus pesticides, organochlorine pesticides, um, MPTP, rotenone, manganese, uh, BMA is one we haven't talked about. It's a, uh, uh, it's a uh, toxin that occurs in, uh, the hell's the name of the plant? I can't remember now. It's a um, tropical plant that people eat in uh, certain parts, huh? No, anyway. It'll come to me later, but it's not coming to me immediately. Uh, this particular compound reacts with CO2, and it forms a compound that activates both the NMDA receptors and another glutamate receptor, the amp ampokinate receptors. Um, and it's been shown to initiate something called ALS Parkinson's dementia complex. So it's a combination of Parkinson's uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and, uh, and, uh, and Alzheimer's disease, okay? Uh, and finally, the pyrethroid pesticides. This has only recently been documented to be involved in Parkinson's disease. All, th all, all of these, I think there are 10 of them, can act and, and do act via increased NMDA activity, every single one of them, okay? Um, am I out of time? No, no, I can you're right, thank you. It's I can thank you, Gene. Five minutes. Okay, I thought I had till 12 o'clock on the schedule, no? Is that right? Go ahead. Well, I, I, the schedule was different here than, I don't know. It's, it's, should I finish? Uh, we have time, of course. OK. Um, the, uh, OK, so uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, we have what? We have uh, a whole bunch of these. Most of them act uh, by, um, at least potentially by excessive NMDA activity. So iron is a uh, hepatotoxicant, so it can cause hepatic encephalopathy. So uh, lead, uh, I mentioned br briefly before, uh, acts to lower glutamate transport, increase NMDA activity. Mercury does the same. Organophosphorus pesticides uh, also act by excessive NMDA activity. Organic chlorine pesticides, organic solvents. Um, 
Mana, we talked about earlier, uh, works on Parkinson's, also works on Alzheimer's. BMAA, again, works here. Um, and, and then there are a couple where we're not sure, okay? So if you say, you know, if you argue, well, aluminum and tellurium probably don't, and I don't know whether that's true, but it may well be, uh, we've got eight out of 10, okay? So we still have a lot of these things that can act by excessive NMDA activity to initiate cases of Alzheimer's. Um, multiple sclerosis. What do we got? Chloridine, organochlorine, pesticide. Again, by NM, excessive NMDA, yes. Organophosphorus pesticides, yes. Uh, other pesticides, including very recently pyrethroids, yes. Um, organic solvents, yes. Silicones, we're not sure about. Uh, this is another thing that uh, has been reported to uh, initiate uh, MS. Uh, it clearly produces an inflammatory response, but we don't know whether it increases NMDA activity, okay? So, uh, so we've got at least four out of five, okay? Um, um, okay, so, okay, so what do we have here? And I, I, I want to go back, um, I'll go back in a little bit to, to talk about, uh, you know, some of the other diseases. So we have a vast array of chemicals that act as toxicants in large part via excessive NMDA activity. And these are usually detected because you can use an NMDA antagonist to lower their toxicity. Um, because of that, excessive NMDA activity must be considered to be a major toxic endpoint, comparable in importance to the other two major toxic endpoints that have been, uh, have been shown and are accepted in toxicology namely genotoxicity. We know that many different carcinogens act to change the genetic structure. They're said to be genotoxic. And, um, and so they, a lot of them act through that uh, toxic endpoint. And endocrine disruption is another thing that uh, has been uh, widely accepted and has often been looked at. Here we have a huge number of toxicants that act by excessive NMDA activity. So I'd argue that they are comparable in importance in medicine uh, with these other two groups. And so that's obviously uh, a very important concept. Uh, the, the second thing is that chemicals acting via excessive NMDA activity are important initiators of chronic inflammatory diseases. Uh, and these are all diseases where one can at least make a case that they're known as cycle diseases. And this pattern of action is seen in Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and multiple sclerosis, where most classes of initiating chemicals can clearly act via excessive NMDA activity. Now, let me just say, um, these three diseases are clearly not the only diseases that are at least potentially known as cycle diseases where this same pattern occurs, okay? We've already talked about MCS and a little bit about CFS, but there are a whole bunch of others, and those include uh, autism, they include asthma, uh, they include uh, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, um, they include tinnitus, uh, and, and, uh, and so, you know, we have quite a number of others that may also act along, where, where, where chemicals may also act along these pathways to, uh, uh, in, in this way. So, what I would argue is the following, that if what I'm saying is correct, and obviously I'm arguing strongly that it is, there are two very important concepts here that really are, uh, at least can be viewed as being of historic importance. One is that we have a whole new uh, important toxic endpoint for many different toxicants in the body, and that's very important in toxicology. Secondly, in terms of environmental medicine, we have a whole new approach to initiation of disease, uh, which involves uh, these agents, these chemicals that act via excessive NMDA activity. And so, uh, you know, so that I think has to be viewed as a very important concept in environmental medicine. And let me just point out that the only really well accepted um, paradigm for uh, initiation of, of uh, you know, environmental disease has been in uh, carcinogenesis, you know, where you have lots of different carcinogens that act as genotoxins that 
produce mutations in genes that have roles in cancer. And so what I'm arguing here is that we have a whole different, a whole uh, bunch of uh, things that work by excessive NMDA activity. So um, here's the cycle. And uh, I, uh, and I, there's one thing I wanted to emphasize here that I haven't really discussed, and that is we know that when you have a large stimulation of the NMDA receptors, and this has been studied extensively in animals and in cell culture, uh, you get uh, large increases in intracellular calcium, you stimulate these two enzymes, you get a lot of nitric oxide, and you get a lot of peroxynitrite, okay? So those things clearly occur and have been studied over and over and over again, okay? Um, it's also true that this mitochondrial cascade that I mentioned has been shown to be triggered by excessive NMDA activity, essentially the whole cascade. Uh, and there are other things in the cycle that have also been shown to be triggered, including INOS induction, which as you can see is not closely tied here, but if you turn on the whole cycle, you're gonna turn that on as well, okay? so. Uh, so, so the NMDA receptors produce responses that go very deeply into the cycle, and that may be uh, why uh, stimulation of the NMDA receptors can be so effective in turning on the cycle. Now, that's not the only way you can turn the cycle on. We know you can turn the cycle on by turning on the inflammatory parts, and there's probably one agent that works via BH4 depletion. Uh, and so there are other ways of doing it, but a lot of things work via that. Okay, so the five principles, the cycle, and the tenth paradigm of human disease. So basically I'm arguing that uh, the nono cycle is the tenth paradigm, and I uh, again thank uh, Dr. Pilar Munoz-Calera for talking about that and for inviting me. Thank you.